The resurrection of Jesus really is the pivotal event of history. Anybody can claim to be the Son of God, as Jesus clearly did. The question is, can you back it up? What evidence is there to support your claim? What credentials do you have? And if Jesus really did return from the dead, that's excellent evidence that he is who he claimed to be, the one and only Son of God. To weigh the validity of Jesus' resurrection, we must first consider his death. Many skeptics have proposed that Jesus merely fainted on the cross or was drugged and later escaped as part of a conspiracy. By contrast, the four gospel narratives collectively describe the events of his public beating, death by crucifixion, and burial. Pilate had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Mark 15, 15. Chances of surviving crucifixion were extremely bleak. Crucifixion and the tortures that normally preceded it was the worst way to die in antiquity. A person was scourged to the point usually that their intestines, arteries, and veins were laid bare. And then after that, a person was dragged out where they were impaled to a cross or a tree and then left hanging there in excruciating pain. In fact, the word excruciating comes from the Latin, out of the cross. Jesus was being tried and executed as a rebel leader. Now, in the Roman army, if you were responsible for looking after one prisoner of war, even if he was an, a rather insignificant prisoner of war, if you let him get away, your life would be forfeit in place of his, and life was very cheap. If you were looking after the execution of a rebel leader and you let him get away, you're in deep trouble. You know, you're not going, going back home to your wife and kids, no way, game over. The Romans were very, very good at killing people. They specialized in it. They prided themselves on it. Perhaps the most definitive statement of Jesus' death at the hands of the Romans is recorded in the Gospel of John. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. John 19, 34. Medical experts have concluded that this account from John, an eyewitness of the crucifixion, is evidence that as he suffocated on the cross, Jesus' heart had ruptured. There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. Matthew 27, 57 through 60. All four gospels tell us that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That's a remarkable statement, um, and certainly a historical statement. The evidence for that is, first of all, uh, Joseph of Arimathea is identified as a member of the council, the Sanhedrin, that condemned Jesus. The presence of Joseph of Arimathea in the empty tomb narrative indicates that this is a historically reliable account of what really happened. His name would have been known to people in those days very much like a United States senator would be known today. It would have been very clear where his tomb was so that there would have been no question about the location of Jesus' burial. It also, I think, indicates that the burial account of Jesus could not have been made up. It is highly unusual to find that the person who alone has the courage to go to Pilate and give Jesus an honorable burial is not members of his family, faithful disciples who followed him to the end. Instead, it is a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the very high court, all of whom, Mark says, had condemned Jesus of Nazareth to the cross. The fact that it is Joseph of Arimathea who is the person responsible for giving Jesus an honorable burial is an awkward and embarrassing fact for the early church, and yet this tradition is faithfully preserved in almost all of the traditions that we have about the burial of Jesus. If Jesus really was killed by the Romans, if his body really was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, then the next focus of my investigation became obvious. On the first Sunday after the crucifixion, was the tomb of Jesus Christ really empty?
On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Luke 24, 1. The empty tomb story also has a very embarrassing feature of it that is preserved in the memory of the early church, namely the discovery of the empty tomb by women. Now, in order to appreciate this, you have to understand something of the status of women in Palestinian Jewish society. In that society, which was a patriarchal society, women were frankly second-class citizens. If you were going to invent an account about an empty tomb, then why on earth would you invent witnesses, primary witnesses, whom no one would believe. In fact, they would scoff at that later on. Supposing you were inventing the story of the resurrection of Jesus, many people have said, oh, this was all just dreamed up later on. Well, how would you have done that? The one thing you wouldn't have done would have been to have not only a woman, but a woman who's got, uh, nobody quite knows what, but a fairly shady past as your prime witness. And yet there she is, Mary Magdalene in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and particularly in John. And already by the middle of the second century, the pagans are sneering, oh, this is just based on the testimony of hysterical women, you can't believe that. But the early Christians stuck to their story, they stuck to their guns, they stuck to the women. They said, this is how it was. Now, they just would never have made that up. And that actually has enormous ramifications. If this is how the story was, and they didn't change it um, to airbrush Mary out, then this really must have been what happened on that first Easter day.